Uh, Dia Yid Galer and welcome to this video on Falta Ireland's Sustainable Festivals Guidelines. A huge thanks to you all for taking the time to explore these guidelines which Native Events put together in collaboration with Falta Ireland. My name is Megan Best and I head up Native Events founded in 2017. Native Events is Ireland's leader in creative climate action with a focus on festivals, events and cultural activities. We are a team of dedicated sustainability experts with over 15 years of education and experience in delivering on climate action initiatives in the creative sector. Our aim is to transition the Irish events and cultural sector to sustainable and circular models. And before we get started on going through these guidelines in detail, I'm going to set the scene by explaining a little bit about who we are and what we do. Our approach takes in three pillars. So consultancy, which means devising workable strategies and programs for both public and private sector organizations in all those high impact areas like waste, energy, transport, and communications. A couple of examples of this type of work are a partnership with UK Creative Climate Action charity, Julie's Bicycle, with whom we established Julie's Bicycle Europe. And over the course of last year, we worked on the development of a climate action policy and implementation plan for Arts Council Ireland, which was a big job. Uh, we're also currently working with the Regional Waste Management Planning Offices on an industry-wide consultation and series of pilots to eliminate single-use plastics at Irish events. And we work with individual festivals too. Galway Theatre Festival, Cork International Film Festival, and All Together Now Festival are some excellent examples of these. Uh, and event production. Curation, design and delivery of events, including conferences, markets, training days and activations. Some nice examples of this are the Body and Soul Festival, a true pioneer in sustainability and a signatory to the EU Green Deal for Circular Festivals. I'll tell you more, a little bit more about that later. And we're also working on a series of events with Quilt to Nature, facilitating biodiversity discovery days, fungi foraging and tree planting, to name but a few. Uh, a third strand to our business is eco event equipment hire. So this means the supply of solar arrays and batteries to stages, films and exhibitions. We also do upcycled furniture, decor and art installations, and we're moving into reusables too. Some examples of our recent equipment hire projects include renewable energy provision for the Lynch and Farga project, a climate action installation across Ireland. We also recently did a conference stand build for Dublin City Council based on the principles of the circular economy. So this is driven by design to eliminate waste and pollution, to circulate products and materials at their highest value for longer and to regenerate nature. So essentially, we cover the full 360 for sustainable events, incorporating systems thinking and circular design principles to design and devise those impactful cultural interventions. OK, so why are we here? Um, so let's take a look at this, uh, because simply put, climate change is real. On Friday, the 11th of November in 2022, the temperature was 18 degrees Celsius in Dublin. And that's not right for Ireland in November. I think personally, that's pretty terrifying. And if you're here today watching this video, you probably feel the same. I've got a few images here to illustrate climate change. So on the 25th of August 2022, the government of Pakistan declared a state of emergency because of flooding. You guys probably remember this. This is the image on the left. The average flood depth was around three and a half metres and approximately 1,700 people lost their lives in that disaster. 7.9 million people were displaced and 33 million people were affected. This is in a country that contributes relatively little to creating climate change. Central then is a photo of the wildfires in Siberia in Russia last year. The total area of the fires was more than 100,000 hectares. Some 1,300 buildings and 60 settlements across Siberia burned down, including 200 homes. On the right then is the Great Barrier Reef in Australia following a bleaching event. The scientists are now saying that 70 to 90% of all existing coral reefs are expected to disappear within the next 20 years due to warming oceans, acidic water and pollution. So I included these examples because I think they illustrate that the effects of climate change are being felt everywhere. Um, as far as Pakistan in the Middle East, as far north as Siberia, where warming is happening four times faster than elsewhere in the world, and as far south as Australia. Of course, at home in Ireland, we're feeling it too. This on the left is a farmhouse near Athlone. This photo was taken in 2015 when the Shannon burst its banks. Central then are the wildfires burning out of control in Wicklow in July of last year. 
And the last are harmful algal blooms along the Kerry coast, increasing in frequency and intensity as a result of climate change. And 2023 is forecast to be hotter again. And then on to this terrifying image. This is the temperature change over the past 70 odd years, which is pretty much my mum's lifetime. She was born in 1945. Temperature change is greatly varied in different regions of the world, with the warming concentrated on land, which is a real shame because that's where we live. And the greatest warming is happening up there at the Arctic Circle of between two and four degrees, which is really scary because that's where the ice is. So our global aircon is being decimated as well as those boreal forests in Siberia. And what is it that's driving all of this change and its devastating effects? Well, world population has more than tripled in the last 70 years in my mum's lifetime, from 2.5 billion in 1951, and on November the 15th to 2022, so just last year, we passed the 8 billion global population milestone. And it turns out that all of these people really like stuff. Here's another fun fact. In 2020, which was a year we'll never forget, the mass of man-made stuff in the world surpassed the global living biomass. And it's the production, distribution, consumption, and disposal of all this stuff fueled by fossil fuels that's creating that climate change and all the problems that we're experiencing. It's pretty wild, isn't it? So the international response to climate change is battled out at the Conference of the Parties, which is now an annual affair held in November last year in Sharm el-Sheikh in, in Egypt. And there were some really big results last year, a change in the narrative. For the first time, the parties to the UN Climate Convention have acknowledged the critical linkages between cultural health, heritage and climate change. Explicit attention was paid to cultural heritage in the COP27 cover decision, which is called the Sharm el-Sheikh Implementation Plan. And this follows increasing engagement by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, who we've all heard loads about, with culture and heritage, and with the valorization of diverse knowledge systems. And this is you guys, because festival organizers are creators of culture. And we have a huge role to play in the great decarbonization, which is, let's face it, the defining challenge of our generation. So what are festivals doing then on an international level? A really nice example of collaboration is the Green Deal for Circular Festivals, an international consortium that we're involved in. Native Events is a co-signatory with Body and Soul to this deal, an initiative of the Dutch Ministry for the Environment, signed in 2019 by 17 international festivals from across the EU, including Shambhala in the UK, We Love Green in France, Roskilde in Belgium, and Digital in the Netherlands, among others. And the idea for the Green Deal is that all signatories pledge to become fully circular by 2025. And we achieve this through sharing knowledge and initiatives, regular workshops and co-creation of toolkits. And I can honestly say that it's due to being part of this pledge with these international partners that gave us, who are changing the face of Europe's festival industry, that gave us the courage to push forward with some really pioneering initiatives at Body and Soul Festival in 2022. Uh, fast forward from 2019 to 2022, and there's now 26 more international festivals signed up to the Green Deal. It's becoming a real community from all over Europe. So Ireland, UK, France, Portugal, Denmark, Netherlands, Belgium, Bulgaria, Turkey and, and Serbia. And the collaboration is widening its focus, linking circular festivals and circular cities. At ADE Green in last October, where this photo was taken, sessions were held with policymakers from Amsterdam, Groningen and Utrecht deputy mayors from Paris, Amsterdam and Copenhagen, who were excited by the opportunity for innovation and experimentation that festivals provide, united for a circular and climate neutral world. Then there's a greener future, which was previously called a greener festival. So these guys have been around since 2007 and they offer training, assessments, certification and awards. And a few members of our team are trained assessors with the AGF. The process is pretty tough now, I will say. I've been through it a few times. It highlights the importance of gathering the data so you can truly understand the impact of your festival. A more recent project then that we were, in, we were a partner on is the Future Festival Tools. And this is the development of an EU-wide platform funded by Erasmus, which includes a self-assessment tool, an e-learning course, compilation of case studies, which is quite a chunky uh, compilation, and a trainer's manual. This project literally just went live a couple of months ago and it's free to use for festivals and events organizers Europe-wide. 
And the tool looks at six impact areas of festivals, which were informed by the pillars of the EU Green Deal. So these are food and drink, energy, travel, water, materials and waste, and strategy. So all of this work that we've been doing internationally at home brings us to our recent project, the development of a set of sustainable festival guidelines. As you can see, these themes align with the EU Green Deal and with the future festival tools. And we've been working on these in collaboration with Volta Ireland to make them relevant to you guys in the Irish context and to bring them to you. These are available on the Volta Ireland website, so hopefully you can find some help and guidance and some tips and tricks to start or to move along on the sustainability journeys with your own festivals. Now, a key pillar of Volta Ireland's operational plan is driving climate action. And the festival divisional activity under this pillar was to facilitate access and commitment of Volta Ireland supported festivals to the sustainability program. An important element of this project was the creation and publication of these Volta Ireland sustainable festival guidelines. The Volta Ireland festival and events team wanted to create a set of gui guidelines, but make sure that it was based on engagement with the industry so that they could be realistic and achievable to incorporate into their business and sustainability planning. So with this in mind, the team collaborated with us here at Native Events and we created a survey to give us insight into how festivals are currently adopting sustainability practices across the island. And we successfully surveyed 88 festival organizers and local authorities across all four regions. The results identified concern from festival and events organizers on climate change and environmental issues, but also highlighted a lack of knowledge on what measures can be put in place to make a positive impact. And these findings confirmed the requirement to develop a set of guidelines. As well as the survey, we set up a tax force, which consisted of 14 local authorities and festival organizers across all four regions. And their responsibility was to contribute and provide feedback on the guidelines themselves. We held several fo focus groups with the task force, which proved to be successful as they inspired the team to tailor the guidelines to several types of festivals rather than just to the outdoors. We also gained insights into the great work already being done by festivals on the ground here in Ireland to transition to more sustainable systems. So you'll see as you go through the guidelines that we use these insights as mini case studies throughout the impact areas. And the development of the traffic light system was also created based on the survey and the task force. The guidelines are uh, divided into seven impact areas that also align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So let's chat through the Sustainable Festival Guidelines, a collaboration with Native Events and Falter Ireland to give you to, some tips and tricks for how to use this document. We devised these guidelines on the basis of a traffic light system so that no matter where you are in your journey, you can pick them up and see what the next steps might be. So under each impact area, there are steps and initiatives that you can take with your team to improve your sustainability and take climate action. Just starting out means you are starting to measure those impacts, be that understanding levels of waste, different waste streams or energy usage and exploring those alternatives. Making progress then means that you have good sight across where you're at and you have systems and processes in place. This might be good communications channels, good access to your data, and you're working with your team and suppliers with contractual obligations on reporting. Leading the way then means that you have been monitoring your environmental impacts for some time and have seen impact reductions. And you are collaborating widely then with your stakeholders to achieve meaningful and impactful change. Bear in mind that you might be at different stages of progress under different impact areas. Every festival is unique and everywhere in Ireland has different challenges. You might be able to achieve good inroads in waste reduction or in food and beverage initiatives, but you could still be struggling with travel and transport. That's okay. The idea is that you can use these guidelines to coordinate your efforts allocate tasks and responsibilities to various members of your team wherever they have their influence and to take the next best steps that you can take towards achievable, measurable results. So what we're also looking to do with the guidelines is to work outwards through your spheres of influence. At the center are the things that you can directly control, the writing of your sustainability policy, the plans you make for the next outing of your show, the engagement that you do with your core team, then there is a middle circle, if you will, the influence that you can have over your suppliers, wording you can put into contracts and a procurement policy that you can put in place, uh, requirements that you can work into fundraising agreements and so on. And then, of course, there is the influence you can have on your wider stakeholder group, audience behavior, 
through messaging, both pre-event and on-site at your show, and through the design of your infrastructure, which can be simple but effective with a little bit of thought put into it. So to go at this in a coordinated way, it's easiest to take it step by step. So you want to decide which type of festival is more applicable to your activities, either outdoor single destination or indoor multi-venue, or perhaps a blend of both. Read through the relevant sections of the guidelines and circle any activities that you have already undertaken. So this will give you a sense of where you're at on your journey under that impact area. Circulate the marked up guide then to your core team and dedicate a session or two to discussing the development of your sustainability strategy. Then you can gain an understanding of where your team's priorities are and what is achievable with the resources that you currently have. As a guide, we recommend focusing on maybe two or three impact areas each year or each iteration of the show to be built on the following time out while also bringing in a new focus. Trying to do too much from the outset often leads to resources being spread way too thin, causing frustration and disappointment. Achieving actual resu results in one impact area is a big win for your team and provides motivation then for the next action and the next time around. So when you and your team have decided on the actions you're going to take, allocate a responsible team member against them and agree on a deadline. You can use these guidelines as a worksheet for this so that, um, so that you can make the commitment more definite. Ask your team member to keep notes of the challenges and successes in the implementation of the action or initiative so that these learnings can be captured and can inform further actions going forward. Most importantly, include reporting on actions in your debriefs after the festival. So the first impact area is to explore is energy. Ireland's National Energy and Climate Plan sets a target of at least 32.5% improvement in energy efficiency by 2030, and the Climate Action Plan sets a target of 70% renewable electricity production by 2030, and aiming to achieve a 51% reduction in overall greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Great news for Ireland. And to combat the CO2 emissions at our events, we need to look at our energy use. Power can account for up to 70% of a festival's core, that's scope one, carbon emissions. But all events do require power. Greenfield sites can't connect to the mains and often there isn't even enough power available to connect to the grid for urban events such as markets. Multi-venue festivals also consume energy and many of our cultural venues are housed in these older buildings. They often aren't very energy efficient. This means that the first step must be to get work together to understand our energy consumption needs, aim to reduce them, and then make the switch to renewables wherever we can. So just starting out with energy, it's a critical component of any festival and how we man manage it can significantly affect our environmental impact. So in the initial stages, we want to create accurate power specifications. This is crucial. So we advise reaching out to all power users at your event to get the specifics of the power connections that they need, even down to the level of the equipment that they're using if you can. This will help you provide power more efficiently and avoid over-provisioning your power. Once you have your specifications, create and stick a power switch on off schedule. This is a really important one for both indoor and outdoor festivals, sticking to a switch off schedule and making sure that you're only using power when you actually need it. Uh, during this phase for outdoor festivals, it's essential to work with your power contractor to monitor your fuel usage and loads for generators. If you're primarily using diesel generators or fossil fuels, which is the case for most Irish festivals, it's crucial to collaborate with your suppliers to source more environmentally friendly power options. There is an increasing number of these options, including hydrogen, hydrogenated vegetable oil, or HVO, becoming available in Ireland. And even really small steps count. So you could consider running smaller activations or stages on batteries or a combination of solar and batteries. Charge power users at your event according to the size of their power connection, and if there are issues with power distribution, consider charging for extra connections. This encourages, through uh, finances, more energy efficient behaviors. For indoor and multi-venue festivals, work with your venue managers. Use electricity or diesel bills to estimate your CO2 emissions. Most electricity bills actually have the CO2 emissions associated written on the back of them nowadays. You can find conversion factors on the website of the SEAI, the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, and this might seem a little bit complex initially, but over time you will find it invaluable for monitoring and reducing your event's carbon footprint. 
as you progress then, your energy supplier will become an essential partner. So work towards a plan to increase energy efficiency and reduce fuel usage. Make it a contractual obligation for your supplier to provide a detailed post-event energy report. And this should include energy monitoring data and fuel consumption ideally broken down by area. Then you can achieve, uh, aim to achieve a mix of energy provision, including hybrid generators, biofuel, solar and battery systems, and a connection to the national grid if possible. Also use those power meters to monitor energy use in key areas like catering, campsite facilities, ca uh, traders and production areas, and your stages. As you lead the way then, uh, you want to start convening meetings with all the relevant stakeholders on energy, and together, co-create a smart power plan and work towards gaining a good understanding of your greenhouse gas emissions profile. Start making the switch to LED lighting for your stages and areas and establish circuit controls on lighting that are activated by timers or sensors. This applies to both indoor and outdoor festivals. For outdoor urban-based festivals, consider connecting to grid power on a renewable energy tariff if you can and you will need to collaborate with your local authority to create a new grid connection to enable this. So you want to start setting new, more ambitious targets every year, using the data that you gather at each event as a benchmark. It's the data that gives you the power to make the change. Finally then, at this stage, you could consider working with an external organization, such as a consultancy or a university or an accreditation body, to assess your greenhouse gas emissions and link in with the SEAI and research institutes on a nationwide energy efficiency campaign. But most importantly, always delegate a team member to be responsible for these tasks and to record their outcomes and learnings. Keep your communications transparent about your challenges and successes as your journey can inspire others. So before we wrap up on energy, I wanted to emphasize a key point. The process of reducing the environmental impact of our energy usage starts with improving energy efficiency. We can't achieve the decarbonization of our society solely by switching to renewables. It's essential that we first understand and reduce our energy consumption. And this process starts with education and behavior change, followed with um, engagement with all of its stakeholders. So everyone involved in the event, from the organizers to the attendees, has a part to play in this process. We must make everyone aware of their energy consumption and the importance of reducing it. For instance, by implementing a switch off policy and promoting the use of energy efficiency, efficient equipment, we can make a significant difference. Next, we can explore a mix of those technologies. Can we use those biofuels or hybrid generators, solar and batteries at the festival? By identifying areas of the festival where alternatives could be used, we can gradually increase the use of sustainable energy options across the entire festival site. To measure our progress, we needed to establish key indicators and outcomes. Um, this progress measuring matrix could include the degree to which all stakeholders at the event are aware of and working towards energy consumption reduction. That's a nice KPI. The successful implementation of a switch off policy and the usage of energy efficiency equipment, efficient equipment across your festival. You're looking to try and achieve a tangible reduction in energy consumption and behavioral changes towards energy use. You could start looking at the mix of technologies being used and the increased use of alternatives across the festival. Another uh, measurable is the decrease in CO2 emissions related to energy and the improvements identified through consistent reporting. So these measures will not only help to reduce the carbon footprint, but also increase its positive profile among attendees, artists, and the wider public. The journey towards energy efficiency and sustainability is a shared one, and every small change and improvement matters. It is an ongoing process, but together we can make a significant difference. So now we're going to talk about travel and transport for festivals. And to reduce emissions associated with events, we need to plan transportation with carbon efficiency in mind. It's worth noting here that as we live on an island, tackling air travel as part of your CO2 emissions reduction strategy is going to be tricky. Flying is, of course, the biggest culprit on an individual carbon footprint level, emitting roughly 255 grams of CO2 per person per passenger for every kilometer traveled. But the second guilty culprit is the private car with just one occupant, emitting on average 192 grams of CO2 per kilometer. So this mode of transport emits over, over four times more CO2 than traveling by train or six times more than traveling by coach. 
Of course, equipment and infrastructure are transported to festival sites on heavy goods vehicles, with emissions from road transport being a major contributor to our national carbon footprint. So getting on top of this is a great starting point. Travel and transport is a crucial aspect of any festival, but one with significant potential for environmental impact. So to talk about how we can minimize these, we can start really simply. So for anyone just starting out, there's some very easy steps to take. Firstly, we want to start considering everyday actions. Could video calls replace unnecessary journeys? And they certainly have done over the last two years. I think we can start to consider local con contractors and suppliers. Choosing local services not only supports your community, but it also reduces transport needs. Can we organize shared vehicles for our staff, crew and performers? Can we book local hotels? And many of you are probably already doing this, as these steps also make sound financial sense. But actively researching this and making decisions through a sustainability lens really is the first step. Next, we want to think about the festival communications. How can we promote sustainable travel options, such as cycling, buses, car shares, or trains? Can we work with our venues to incentivize active, active travel, promoting facilities like bike lockups and public transport links? Now we, we can take a look at those making progress. At this stage, we should be creating a sustainable travel policy aiming to record all of our business or organizational travel throughout the year. This can help us calculate our annual greenhouse gas emissions. We should also look into understanding and encouraging fuel efficient driving, particularly among our festival crew and staff. And let's not forget our artists. They can use their influence to raise awareness of the impacts of travel and to promote sustainable options. So essentially what we're doing again is working outwards through the sphere of influence from our core team, what we can do, what we can do with our wider contractors and how we can influence artists and audience. At the making progress stage, you can consider the need of your audience. So engage them through social media and post festival surveys to understand their travel habits and how they can be improved. We can also use online carbon calculators to measure the emissions associated with the events, travel and transport. Now, for those of us leading the way, let's think about how we can help our staff travel more sustainably. Flexible working hours can help avoid peak travel times and incentives and facilities can encourage active travel like cycling. We can also explore partnerships with electric vehicle companies, offering promotional opportunities and discounted rates for staff switching to EVs. At this advanced stage, we should be requiring all of our suppliers and stakeholders sub to submit their transport data so you can help to monitor it. Monitor it. This helps to understand the full picture of our festival's travel and transport impact. In terms of the festival communications, we should provide clear travel information like maps of the site and the surrounding area, links to all of those pu uh, public transport timetables, and information on local cycle routes and secure cycle storage. Lastly, consider working with service providers to provide dedicated transport to the festival site from key cities or towns. This could be a mutually beneficial partnership, increasing advertising for your event and the use of sustainable transport options. Leading the way also means setting really ambitious targets for travel and transport impact reductions and working with all the suppliers and partners to achieve them. So this should include understanding residual emissions profile and working to either offset or inset these. As we're discussing these guidelines, I need to emphasize the importance of assigning these tasks to specific members of your festival team. Delegation is a crucial part of effective management and ensures that each of these tasks is completed efficiently. It also promotes accountability and encourages everyone to take part in the sustainability mission. So when a task is completed, make sure to record it. Keeping track of completed tasks will not only help in organizing the workload, but also allows you to measure your progress. Documentation plays a key role in evaluating the success of your sustainability actions. And more importantly, don't forget to record the outcomes and learnings from each task. Transitioning to sustainable practices is a continuous journey of learning and improvement. So by documenting your learnings, you can identify what worked well, what could be improved, and how you can make your next festival even more sustainable. So let's commit to these actions, delegate these tasks effectively, and always keep track of our progress and learnings. Together, we can make our festivals a powerful force for sustainability. So as we wrap up this section on travel and transport, let's take a minute to reflect on the importance of measuring our progress. We know that reducing environmental impacts from transport is a significant challenge, 
especially when you consider that car travel is a major contributor to Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions, and public transport options can often be quite limited. But that doesn't mean the situation is hopeless, quite the opposite, in fact. So an impactful communications campaign may, can make a significant difference, nudging attendees towards more sustainable travel options and changing the narrative around festival transport. We can also make strides forward by partnering with transport providers to make offer more sustainable alternatives and improve public transport accessibility. So a progress measuring matrix for this area, using the actions from the guide, can be considered. Remember, the specifics will need to be decided within your team. Key indicators might be staff and crew actively measuring and sharing their travel-related carbon footprint. Partnerships could be established with several public transport providers for your festival. And achieving travel-related emissions reductions and creating a plan to offset emissions that cannot be mitigated. But to achieve these indicators, we might initiate the following activities or projects. So this means providing a travel logging sheet for your staff and crew and issuing regular reminders to ask them to fill it in. Establishing partnerships that include that cross-promotion and reporting on impact reduction. And conducting annual carbon footprint reporting and partnering with an offset or an inset provider. The outcomes then of these actions could be a thorough understanding of travel-related CO2 emissions for the organisation and an increase in the number of attendees travelling by public transport. The establishment then, as an, another outcome, could be the establishment of a pathway to net zero emissions for the organization. So now for the, another impact area, materials and resources. Once upon a time, this was called waste management. But the first thing to note is that waste is a design flaw. Festivals create waste materials through building, eating, drinking, and temporary living, and the processing of all these mixed materials creates carbon emissions. Waste management is a real pain point for festival organizers, and this is the most visible impact for audiences, and dealing with waste materials incurs significant costs and creates huge carbon emissions. There are loads of different types of materials being turned into waste streams at festivals, and they're all mixed up together, which makes it very difficult to manage. The most important piece to remember is the implementation of the waste hierarchy. So let's take a look at it. This is the waste hierarchy. It helps to guide us towards more sustainable choices. Starting from the most desirable option, we have refuse. The most effective way to manage waste is not to create it in the first place. So this requires us to refuse waste from arriving at the festival venue in and of itself. So this could mean an implementing a ban on single-use plastics, for example. Then reduce, so engaging with your stakeholders, including waste hauliers, litter pickers, production teams, staff, traders, caterers, the audience, and ask them to consider to reduce how they can reduce what they are bringing to your festival. Refuse then, we should active, reuse, I mean, sorry, we should actively encourage reuse in all elements of the festival. So this could apply to water bottles, coffee cups, and serveware, for instance. Reusing items can significantly reduce our waste footprint. Recycling is a key to the, a sustainable festival. So capturing good recycling rates by encouraging source separation. So this means having an appropriate number of bins in strategic locations and clear signage on every bin and consistent colorways and symbols for the different types of bins. Composting then helps return organic materials back to the earth, completing the nutrient cycle. Work with your traders and caterers to implement effective food waste management systems and conduct spot checks at your festival. Finally then, if we can't refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle or compost, only then should we consider disposal. However, by staying on top of waste management on site at your festival and engaging with all of the users of our bin systems, we can ensure that disposal is only ever the last resort. So this hierarchy allows us to rethink our waste and consider it as a resource instead. It provides a clear framework for managing resources sustainably and forms a crucial part of our guidelines for sustainable festivals. So next, we'll move on to more specific strategies for managing resources at different stages of a festival's sustainability journey. But for now, let's uh, take a minute to reflect on the importance of viewing waste not as an inevitable, inevitable outcome of our events, but as a resource that can be effectively managed and reduced. So to dive deeper into the specific actions and strategies that we can implement at different stages of our festival sustainability journey, these guidelines will help us to manage our resources more efficiently, moving away from a waste-orientated mindset towards that circular economy. 
So firstly, it's important to comprehend the nature of the waste being produced at the festival. So request tonnage reports by waste stream from your contractor and establish those annual targets for waste reduction and recycling rates. This understanding is crucial for planning waste management strategies and setting achievable goals. When engaging your waste contractor before the event, clarify that a breakdown of general waste and recycling rates will be required in their final report. Regular communication with your waste contractor about the materials that can or cannot be recycled is also really important. Consider initiating a zero waste to landfill policy. So this means that everything should be reused, recycled, compost, or at a very last resort, sent for waste to energy. Polystyrene is obviously a significant source of non-biodegradable wastes, thus consider banning it, especially for food and beverage suppliers. And also look into developing a plan to reduce single-use plastics on your, at your festival. Remember to work with your waste contractor to understand what materials and levels of contamination in the bins that they can accept. Switching to compostable serveware, cutlery and cups can greatly reduce the amount of waste sent to landfill However, you need to ensure that your waste contractor can accept these items, and that's an important one. Reusable cups, then, are a popular and effective method of reducing waste at festivals. So consider introducing a cup return deposit scheme or a circular cup system. And at the same time, educate your festival staff about the recycling scheme and encourage the use of reusable bottles by providing refill points throughout the festival. A vital part of managing resources effectively is that communication. So let your audience know about your recycling initiatives as an essential part of achieving impact reduction at the festival. So when we're moving into making progress then, we want to be moving towards the development of a comprehensive waste management plan. So this includes understanding what types and quantities of resources are produced at different stages of the festival and how they can be best managed. So you wanna to work towards initiating a single use plastic ban for stakeholders that you have the control over. And this ban should extend to backstage areas and artists who are typically high users of single-use plastics. During the festival then, your sustainability team should ensure the single-use plastic ban is being followed. And also, you want to create a sustainable procurement policy for the festival based on the AU waste hierarchy. And just to say, all the way through the guidelines, look out for these handy spotlight boxes at the side of the pages, as these include tips and tricks to move you along on the sustainability journey. For example, shown here is a spotlight on reuse and circular systems thinking. So what we want to do is avoid single use across the event and festival production altogether. So making sure that signage and branding are reusable for a number of iterations or a number of years of, of the show. We want to make a switch to hard cups or implement, implement a circular cup system and serve our system if you can in all of your bars and concessions so the drinks are no longer served to visitors in disposable cups. Using reusable serveware and crew catering, for example, ceramic or steel instead of plastics, and reusable cable ties and take down Hessian and dressing for reuse. All of the equipment and materials used at the event should be rental or secondhand, and all of the bills of sets, stages, furniture should be either permanent installs or designed for reuse. So you want to be trying to salvage timber, furniture, signage and decor items, and any leftover food, and we either use them again or redistribute these to other organizations in the local area. Moving into leading the way then, what we want to be doing is creating strong partnerships with your wider network for sharing those materials and resources. This will allow you to both source materials for the festival and reintegrate them as part of a circular economy system afterwards. Remember to delegate each task to a member of the team and record when the task is completed, along with the outcomes and learnings. Managing resources effect effectively is a real team effort and clear communication and delegation are vital for success. In the next section, we'll delve into how to measure the progress of our resource management strategies and discuss how we continually improve our efforts towards managing resources at our festival sustainably. So material usage is one of the most significant environmental impacts of any festival. Remember what I said at the start, about uh, our materials use and the man-made resources having bypassed the biomass uh, on our earth since, uh, since 2020. Now, the temporary nature of festivals and events often leads to high consumption of single-use items, but we can strive to tra transform this pattern and align our operations with circular economy approach, thereby mitigating those environmental implications. 
To achieve this, though, we need to track the progress and make improvements based on our findings. And an example of how we might pre measure progress in this area. Firstly, identify some key indicators. So these could include the successful collection of three to five separate waste streams at the event. Might also involve tracking waste tonnages per audience and aiming for a reduction year on year. Another valuable indicator is the active sharing res of resources with other events and festivals. Next, outline the activities and projects that you plan to undertake. So this could be a comprehensive communications campaign, including briefings, messaging, and signage. Implementing a campaign promoting reusables, targeting staff and audience members. Additionally, create a full inventory of the festival's assets and establish a material bank. The outcomes of these actions then will provide tangible measures of success. So these can be detailed waste reports received from the haulier, a reduced carbon footprint from waste processing, reduced waste handling costs and reduced higher costs for festival equipment and materials, which is where we all want to get to. Further, successful implementation of these strategies can lead to increased creative opportunities through the sharing and reusing of materials. Remember, measuring progress is about more than just keeping track of numbers. It's about using these numbers to inspire change, guide decisions and create a more sustainable festival. So let's talk about food and beverage. Festivals in Ireland have become synonymous with street food type vendors over the course of the past decade. An estimated 5.09 tonnes of food is consumed by attendees at a 5,000 capacity event over the course of a three-day weekend. And the preparation of all of this food involves the procurement of ingredients, the transport of goods, and the potential to create food waste. So it's really key to work with concessions and caterers to ensure that they are producing enough food at the festival to feed everyone, but not too much. So we want to aim for accurate and transparent communication of expected staff and audience numbers and dietary requirements to give to your concessions and caterers so they know what to expect and don't create too much. Engaging your stakeholders on sustainable food and beverage policies is a hugely important aspect of event production. With food and beverage, there lies great potential for sustainable impact with positive messaging, reducing transport miles and supporting local producers. This area has a significant impact on sustainability from the sourcing and preparation of food to the disposal of waste. If you're just starting out on your sustainability journey, a great first step is to create a specific food and beverage sustainability policy. So this policy should outline international and national standards for food sourcing, including requirements for free range, certified organic, rainforest certified and or tra fair trade products. These are good certifications to be looking for for your caterers and your concessions. It should also require that all caterers and food concessions and traders offer at least one vegetarian or vegan menu option. You want to be circulating this policy to all involved and in ensure that they understand its importance. You should also aim to reduce the amount of red and processed meat served at the festival and consider the potential for increased promotion and pricing of higher animal welfare products because it's been shown that people will actually pay a little bit more in here in Ireland for uh, products that they understand that higher animal welfare has been considered. And it's critical that all of your concessions and caterers are actively aiming to reduce food waste. One way to do this is to provide food waste bins for composting in catering, concession areas and audience spaces. Sounds simple, doesn't it? As you make progress then on your sustainability journey, you can start asking more of your concessions and caterers. So you could create a sustainable food questionnaire and circulate it to all of your suppliers. So this will provide you with the information that you need to plan for continued improvement. You should also encourage your concessions and caterers to purchase from food producers that guarantee minimum environmental standards and a short supply chains, reducing the food miles. Another way of making progress is to establish an award system for sustainability among concessions and caterers, as this will incentivize their efforts in sustainability and can include benefits such as reduced or free pitches, the, the pitch fees the following year. It's also important to establish really close working relationships with concessions and caterers and to include in their contracts the responsibility to manage waste properly. So it's all about engagement. It's having face to face meetings. It's bringing everybody together and giving them a good briefing on your sustainability policy so that everybody has an opportunity to feed into the process, to buy into it and to create change. 
when you're leading the way then in sustainability, your food and beverage sustainability policy should contain specific actions and targets for food related impact reduction. So this might include audits for each stall holder, targets for improvement, and building relationships with local food and beverage producers. You could also use the festival as a platform to demonstrate innovative solutions to the issue of food waste. Consider Food Cloud, for example, who take leftover food and redistribute it to charity. As always, it's crucial to delegate these tasks to a specific staff member. Record when they're completed and record all of those lessons learned. So whoever looks after the catering and the concessions at your festival can start to incorporate these actions and make some progress on them. Each one of these actions is a step towards a more sustainable future for your festival. So how do we go about measuring progress in reducing environmental impacts from our food offerings at festivals? This might seem a bit challenging at first, but by using a progress measuring matrix, we can make it either easier. So some key indicators might be that all food traders at the event are on board and compliant with the sustainability policy. So this ensures that everyone is on the same page about the sustainability goals and is actively working towards them. Menus, and, uh, menus served by traders and caterers are heavily weighted towards in-season produce. So this is not only reduces transportation emissions, but also supports local farming and promotes fresh seasonal foods. Another indicator might be that your food waste tonnage per audience member is reduced. And this reflects the eff effectiveness of the efforts to minimize food waste at the festival. And then there's some activities or projects that we could undertake to create these in indicators and goals. So co-creating that sustainability policy with your food traders and caterers. So this encourages, as I said, the participation and ownership of the policy by all of your stakeholders. You could collaborate with Board BIA on the provision of an in-season produce information campaign. This is easily available on their website. And this helps to promote the use of local and seasonal produce, thus reducing those transport emissions. Establishing a partnership with a local food charity, and that enables us to no donate unsold food, reducing food waste and supporting local communities and charities. Some potential outcomes then of all of these efforts could include all of the food at the event is certified, fair trade and organic, reflecting the commitment to sustainable food sourcing. How nice would it be able to say that of your festival? That you've, another um, outcome would be that there's buy-in from your traders and caterers, ensuring that they're engaged and invested in the sustainability goals. So everybody is moving together in the same direction. The, another outcome might be the increase of local suppliers. So people in your local area supporting that local economy while reducing transport emissions. You could also be looking at reduced food waste, uh, food waste costs, CO2 emissions, reflecting the successful efforts in reduction and an increased profile for your event as a leader in sustainable food and beverage practices. So what gets measured gets improved. So we could start by tracking these indicators and working towards these outcomes to make our festival as sustainable as possible. So now to talk about water use at festivals. I mean, all events use clean water and produce wastewater and it's becoming an expensive necessary commodity. The conservation of water in Ireland is hugely important, despite the fact that it seems there's plenty of it around. But all water used at a festival has to come from somewhere. There's a huge amount of embodied uh, energy in the clean water that you drink. It is harvested, filtered, processed and transported, all of which uses energy and creates carbon emissions. And in addition, we need to consider the potential for water pollution at festivals. Common pollution sources include uh, cigarette butts, uh, cleaning products, personal shower products, diesel, paint and urine. Pollutants can contaminate local waterways, which can then harm aquatic biodiversity and habitats, which in turn makes them less resilient to climate change. So to focus now on the importance of water conservation at festivals, it's crucial to manage water resources sustainably, not only for the environment, but to ensure water availability for future generations. So creating a water conservation plan and appointing a team member to oversee its implementation is a great first step. So this team member will be responsible for ensuring that everyone understands the importance of water saving, using signage around water points and push button taps and managing a strict schedule for campsite showers if your festival is a campsite festival. 
So another way to do it is to develop a pollution control response plan. So this will help to mitigate pollution risks, such as those associated with cigarette butts, which can contaminate one meter squared around them when dropped on the ground. Debt really bad for greenfield sites. So we want to identify and map all the local waterways on and near your festival site, and it's essential to protect these aquatic ecosystems. One, uh, we also want to monitor contractors' wastewater management plans for portable toilets and promote the use of reusable water bottles. Um, once we start making progress in this area, let's start setting water consumption reduction targets and communicate them to all our stakeholders. Monitoring water usage, checking for unexpected spikes or leaks, and ensuring that all wastewater collection is designed and executed to protect waterways from potential contamination. You want to be testing the water quality of local waterways before and after festival to ensure you haven't impacted on them negatively. This same team member then can document these findings and share them as part of your sustainability communications campaign. When you're choosing your toilet contractor, make water conservation a key consideration. So request and review the wastewater management and treatment plan and identify any water conservation initiatives that they are putting in place that can form part of your sustainability journey. You also want to be thinking about making mulch and buckets readily available in different zones around the festival site to contain spillages quickly. When we've made significant progress with our water management and conservation, we can start to take a leadership role. So again, assigning a team member to investigate alternative sanitation solutions, such as compost loos or vacuum system dry toilets, this could significantly reduce water usage and chemical waste at the festival. Another idea is to appoint a local ecologist to assess the potential impact on biodiversity on and near your festival site. And this person can help to identify biodiversity hotspots and propose suitable protection, protective measures. We'll talk about this a little bit later on in the nature and biodiversity section. Uh, we can start to explore partnerships with international water char charities. Um, your festival can develop these relationships and coordinate joint initiatives. If your festival is near a beach, river or a lake, make it part of the sustainability strategy to protect these waters and associated wildlife. You could collaborate with Irish Water on water conservation awareness campaigns. And this is an important one that we don't really pay enough attention to in Ireland. We are going to need to get more mindful about conserving water. So designate again a team member to manage that relationship and ensure the effectiveness of the campaign. As festival organizers, we have a crucial role in promoting and implementing uh, sustainable practices. So by assigning tasks to specific team members, we ensure accountability, efficiency, and the recording of valuable lessons for future events. So how might we um, measure progress in water conservation at our festivals? It's essential to continually assess the effectiveness of our actions and make improvements when necessary. An example of how we can track our efforts might be looking at some key indicators. So our staff and crew are aware of the importance of water conservation. That's a one key uh, indicator. So we can start to monitor their behavior and feedback. And important, it's important here to notice changes in habits, like taking shorter showers or shutting off taps and being aware of it. Another indicator is you have now a pollution control plan in place and reviewing its effectiveness regularly. Are we successfully containing and managing any potential pollutant spills? our cigarette butts on our sites. Uh, tra a transition to waterless toilets across the site and keeping track of our progress in implementing essential environmental improvements, all key indicators. Projects that can deliver these indicators are water conservation messaging included in the briefings and ensuring that this messaging is clearly conveyed and understood. That wastewater processing is being reviewed, as we said, and identifying any issues or areas for improvement. Another project is to look at the on-site waterways that are on your site or adjacent to it and making sure that these are protected, making sure that the event has not disturbed these crucial habitats. We can start actively investigating the provision of composting toilet facilities. Difficult to do here in Ireland as the facilities don't really exist as of yet, but the more of us who start looking, the more we can drive the market towards this essential change. So recording all of the progress in transitioning to these environmentally friendly solutions. And the outcomes then could be amazing, reducing water consumption, keeping track of water usage to see if the conservation efforts that we're doing are paying off. 
that we've got that infrastructure in place to manage spillages and recording those incidents and how effectively they were managed. That our wastewater collection is situated away from waterways and that the location and maintenance of these facilities, you're aware of it, you understand it and that you're making progress that we're reducing the water use at the festival and the wastewater produced, which leads to a decrease in CO2 emissions associating with transporting sanitary facilities. So by th using this matrix as a guide, and these are just suggestions, again, you will find what you're going to prioritize with your team when you start uh, exploring these. But we can all ensure that we're starting to make continuous strides towards water conservation and reducing our festival's environmental impact. So let's talk about nature and biodiversity at festivals. Festivals and events, indoor and outdoor, offer a unique opportunity to engage with audiences and stakeholders on nature and biodiversity. Since the COVID-19 public health crisis and associated lockdowns, Irish people have started to reconnect with nature and the outdoors, which is fantastic. Awareness and appetite is growing for the protection of nature and biodiversity, as is a recognition of the public health benefits of a healthy environment. So this means that there are now opportunities for integrating nature and environmental themes into programming and messaging and exploring the ecology of your local area as part of your sustainability journey. From an organizational perspective, festivals are often created by groups of hardworking, passionate people with a collective vision. So embedding nature and biodiversity initiatives into team building sessions is a great first step. If you're just beginning your journey into sustainability, a really nice starting point is to bring your core team together to discuss the importance of nature and biodiversity in your sustainability policy. Step out into the outdoors and host your team meetings outside amidst nature to develop a shared appreciation for the environment that we are trying to protect. You could start to make biodiversity protection a part of your day-to-day -day decisions. This means using environmentally friendly cleaning products or choosing local organic in-season food wherever possible. Let's start reaching out to local wildlife groups, immersing yourselves in the knowledge of your local area's nature and biodiversity. And taking a look at Ireland's National Pollinator Plan, there's so much that we can do to start safeguarding our buzzing friends. And then, as you continue to make progress, you'll want to collaborate with a local ecologist to conduct a biodiversity audit of your festival sites. And this works for urban as well as rural festivals. Sharing these findings with your team will build a shared understanding of the species and habitats that you are aiming to protect with your new sustainability strategy. Keeping a pollution response plan handy, as we spoke about in the water section, is another key aspect of your sustainability journey. And everyone, uh, involved in the festivals from your suppliers to your artists needs to be aware of your commitment to biodiversity. And a sense of place can go a really long way in making attendees appreciate the local ecology, incorporating references to local ecology and the history of land use that in your festival programming could do just that. Now, if you really want to lead the way in this area, align your biodiversity strategy with local and national biodiversity action plans. Engage your uh, team in nature conservation and restoration activities like beach cleanups, tree planting and peatland restoration. And why not create a, a pledge for nature for all of your stakeholders? So you could consider partnering with wildlife charities and imagine the difference that you could make if you could facilitate donations and contributions at the festival itself. It's now. Remember, it's crucial that, that to allocate these teams to someone on your team who's responsible and passionate about nature, because keeping track of the tasks and the learnings from them will make your festival's journey towards sustainability all the smoother and more impactful. So how could we measure progress in this impact area in nature and biodiversity? Let's have a little think about it. You might consider those key indicators, such as how integral biodiversity is to your sustainability strategy, or how well nature and biodiversity themes are incorporated in your festival programming. Do your staff participate actively in nature restoration activities? These could be valuable markers of your progress. Your journey might involve working with an ecologist to understand the rich tapestry of species present at your event site, or you might be forging new partnerships centered around the theme of nature restoration. Maybe your team is diving into activities of local wildlife groups, tree planting or beach cleanups, for example. These are all initiatives that could shape the heart of your festival's commitment to nature. 
And the outcomes then are a team that are ecologically literate and connected with nature and an audience that appreciates the festival's aspirations uh, for nature restoration and concrete targets for restoration, like the number of trees to be planted or days spent on restoration and regeneration projects. Involving your audience is an excellent way to amplify your impact. For instance, ticket donations add-ons can enable your attendees to contribute to your, your conservation efforts. Remember that measuring progress is as vital as taking action, as it keeps us on track and ensures our steps towards restoring nature are meaningful and effective. Now to talk about governance and communications at festivals. Festivals have a huge role to play in the transition to a just, equal and low carbon society. The very purpose of a festival is to bring people together for a collective experience. And these large scale gatherings of anywhere from hundreds to thousands of people are an ideal platform to engage and inspire audiences. So taking all of these factors into account makes a festival an ideal space for taking social and environmental action. Festival organizers, you guys, uh, can trial new engagement opportunities with audiences, work with innovative partners, suppliers, and contractors, and apply influence and inspiration all the way along the value chain. As any festival organizer will tell you, large-scale production is an exercise in multi-stakeholder engagement. So this means that your festival presents an excellent opportunity for raising awareness, integrating environmental values, and taking climate action. So let's focus on governance and communications. Just as a conductor or orchestrates a symphony, the governing bodies and channels of communication of your festival can harmonize all of your sustainability efforts. So if you're just starting out in this area, begin by gathering the data on your impact areas. So energy, travel and transport, resources, food and beverage, water, and nature and biodiversity. There are tools out there like the Irish government's Climate Toolkit for Business, or Julie Bi Julie's Bicycle Europe's Creative Green Tools, and these can help. The data not only helps you to set improvement targets for the next festival, but also serves as that comprehensive sustainability report. Data is power. Don't forget, of course, the human, e human element, understanding engagement levels and priority areas. So this comes from qualitative information, such as audience surveys, supplier questionnaires, and sustainability-focused debriefs with your staff and with your crew. These insights will help guide your communications and onboarding campaigns. Environmental sustainability needs to permeate every aspect of your festival now, it's from budgets to procurement, from partnerships to fundraising. And this should be reflected in all of your contracts too. For example, you could create a green staff handbook or introduce initiatives like Meat Free Mondays. Look for those universal standards like the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals to frame your actions and communications. These are globally recognized and provide an excellent action blueprint. It's also vital to ensure clear messaging around your sustain festival sustainability intentions, and that, that makes sure that that's communicated throughout the organization and to the wider public. As you're making progress, consider getting an external certification or assessment of your festival sustainability performance. This helps to, helps to instill confidence in your commitment to sustainability. The a Greener Festival accreditation is a good example of this. It's time to start revising procurement policies to focus on environmentally friendly products and services. As tough as this one is, don't let the cost be the only determining factor. I know that's hard. It's time to start thinking broader. Perhaps a higher cost on, on energy management will lead to a reduction in your fuel bill or reusable cups might lower your cleanup costs. And every contract should contain environmental clauses and criteria at this point. Another key step could be to appoint a dedicated sustainability coordinator for the festival. So this person would ensure consistency in communication, action and accountability throughout the organization. But it's really important to also note here that if you, even if you do appoint a, a dedicated sustainability coordinator, that some of the tasks are going to need to be de de delegated out to other members of your team where they have that specific influence and control. So what your sustainability coordinator is just someone who weaves all those threads together for you. You also want to start to understand how the sustainability initiatives impact different teams and tailor your message accordingly to them. Reaching out to other festivals and events to create a network for skill, asset and resource sharing is another great move at this point towards creating sector benchmarks and driving that societal change. 
an event that has so many stakeholders and a wide network. So the opportunity to create positive change is huge. Internal stakeholders include the whole team, from the event director to the production manager to the guest and uh, the IP manager and the volunteers. Everyone has their part to play. External stakeholders include the sponsors, media, venue owners, artists, and last but not least, of course, the audience. The success of your sustainability initiatives depends on great communications with them all. So when we're moving towards leading the way, your festival can start to set bold mission and vision statements, embracing sustainability, climate action, social diversity and inclusion. Sustainability strategies and policies can be linked to your diversity and inclusion policy, showing that you see social and environmental challenges as being intertwined, which they are. And when we're leading the way, we're keeping all of our communications channels transparent. So publishing an annual impact report, showing your successes, challenges, and overall performance. This inspires others to join you on your sustainability journey. It's time then to start considering adopting sustainable and ethical sponsorship, partnership, and fundraising policies. Even your banking and investment policies can reflect your commitment. For, for instance, you could switch to more ethical banking services or pension funds. Finally, making sustainability a part of every decision that you make and every contract that you sign. So consider how you can become net planet positive, not just within your organization, but all the way along your supply chain. And again, remember that delegation of tasks is crucial, as is tracking their completion and noting the outcomes and learnings from your actions. In doing so, you're building a living, evolving blueprint for your festival's sustainable future. So to discuss measuring progress in governance and communications, this area is pretty crucial because good, good governance symbolizes strong leadership, well-defined actions, financial commitment, and transparency in results. So picture this as a progress measuring matrix. You and your team will need to best decide how to measure your progress using the actions that we've just chatted through in the guide. The matrix is basically a barometer for your sustainability journey. So let's break it down. First, there's those key indicators that we're all very familiar with. These are the vital signs of your festival's environmental health. So do you understand at this point the carbon emissions resulting from the festival activities? Have you put an environmental and social action plan in place for your organization? Do you have strategic partnerships with environmental charities? And these are some of those indicators that provide a snapshot of your current status. Then we can look at activ activities and projects that might achieve these indicators. These are the actions that can push your sustainability needle forward. For example, assigning those responsibilities to a staff member to gather data required for a carbon calculator is an activity. Co-creating and defining the priorities within your team based on those high impact areas is another. And don't forget to use your festival as a platform promoting uh, environmental issues through promotional materials, messaging, and the event program itself. Lastly, then, we'll have the impacts and the outcomes of all of these activities and projects. So these are the tangible, visible results of your efforts. A carbon footprint report, for example, can show you where your environmental footprint stands and identify those areas for improvement by setting targets and goals and appointing actions and responsibilities. And don't overlook the win-win potential of partnering with environmental charities. This can lead to mutual benefit and cross-promotion, and it also increases audience engagement with those environmental actions. So there you have it, a roadmap for measuring your progress in governance and communications in the sustainability world. So this is the tool that will guide you, your team, and your festival on this important sustainability journey. Remember, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So it's time to take that step today. So throughout this video, we've covered a lot of ground. We've dived deep into areas of sustainability, such as energy, travel and transport, resources, food and beverage, water, nature and biodiversity, and of course, governance and communications. It does feel overwhelming at the start, but remember the journey to sustainability is not a sprint, it's a marathon. So your next steps will be then to consult your team, use the guidelines and start to implement your sustainability actions. Start small make realistic goals and celebrate your successes along the way. Remember that each small step contributes to that much bigger impact. If you're looking for more information or resources, visit the resources section on the Fault to Ireland website. 
There you'll find a variety of tools, reports, articles, and links to help guide you on your sustainability journey. And also don't hesitate to reach out to us here at Native for any further questions and or clarification, clarifications. We are here to help. So to wrap up, always remember that your efforts in sustainability are not just for the present, but for future generations. We have the power right now to make a difference and to create a more sustainable and inclusive world through all of our actions. Thanks again for, to everyone for joining us today and for watching our video. And we look forward to seeing your progress, hearing your stories and standing beside you on this vital journey towards sustainability and climate action. Thank you.